possible uh, therapy. And so we want to make sure that those with new or resistant hypertension get worked up for secondary hypertension, part of those guidelines. Mm -hmm. We talked about causes of secondary hypertension. There's a fair number of them. All relatively rare. Remember, secondary hypertension is only 10% of your patient population. Non-pharmacologic therapy, recommended for everyone with a blood pressure of 120 or elevated this time. And all of the things that we know in the DASH dial, we know that we can get about 11 millimeter reduction for each aspect, weight loss, healthy diet, reduced sodium, increased potassium, can reduce blood pressure to a three millimeters. So we add those all up. We can get about 11 millimeter blood pressure reduction. Physical activity, another two or three millimeter reduction in blood pressure add to it in that case, and, and moderation of alcohol. Uh, blood tests that we need in a hypertensive patient are shown here. Uh, relatively simple, but looking at thyroid, urine analysis, and EKG are important in that group. Blood pressure thresholds that we're going to go, again, normal blood pressure under 120. Elevated blood pressure 120 to 129. In that case, we recommend non-pharmacologic therapy in that population and reassess in those individuals. For those people who are higher blood pressure, stage 1, 130 to 139, with cardiovascular risk factors, we have to start medicine and we have to start non-pharmacologic therapy in those. And everyone over 140 will need both non-pharmacologic and medication therapy for them. And we want to reassess them not in a year, but in one to three months in that situation. <laughs> if you have a stable ischemic heart disease, same thing, same goal, 130 over 80. If you have chronic kidney disease, same goal, uh, 130 over 80 in that population. If you have uh, acute intracerebral hemorrhage, that's a difference in the hospital. You back off a little, we tolerate blood pressures 150 to 220 in that uh, population. We don't try to get it ultimately low. Remember the improvements I showed in intensive therapy started one year to two years of therapy. So you don't have to go crazy in the hospital and try to get somebody to a target this day or this week in that uh, patient population. Uh, acute ischemic stroke, again, we can tolerate a little bit of a blood pressure in the hospital, uh, and we can have uh, and tolerate blood pressures up to 180 in that uh, patient population. But thereafter, when they go home, we're going to be aiming for our same targets for patients with a history of stroke we want to again eventually aim for 130 under over 80 in that target population. So again, don't get that concerned in the hospital. You can tolerate a little bit of hypertension and because we don't want to acutely lower blood pressure. Remember that you have a neurovascular system. If we lower your blood pressure, your neural vessels will gradually expand and allow more blood flow to the brain at that point in time. But it's not something that can happen in one hour or one day. It will take time to gradually do that. That's why we want to gradually introduce some of these therapies. Resistant hypertension, again, we're wor worried about secondary <coughs> hypertension. Or pseudo-resistance, where they're not taking the medicine, or they're taking a medicine that raises their blood pressure that we're not aware of at that time. Uh, hypertension crisis and blood pressure over 180, risk symptoms is certainly somebody who should be admitted and handled. If we look at our sequential management of uh, blood pressure, we want to clearly measure it in the office. If we did suspect white coat or mask hypertension, we have to put a home blood pressure or an ambulatory blood pressure on those. Identify the goals, work with the patients, team-based therapy, important and use the healthcare technology that's out there to be a tool rather than a detriment to your office visit for the individuals. Summary of the goals for blood pressure, 
Pretty simple. Look at the list on the right, 130 over 80, all the way down to the bottom. This can't be any simpler than this at this point for following these targets. And the thresholds are 130 to 140 over 80 on this side. So in these individuals, as a goal, we start out with non-pharmacologic, that is lifestyle modifications first. We move into medicine as needed in those individuals to achieve those goals. The complete hypertension guidelines are shown here. They're included in the printout that I have for the CDPH for that. They go over a lot more detail. So we've only discussed basic and simple guidelines at this point. The complete guidelines are in the document that I have on the table. Now, how do we look at this as we've evolved over the years? Hypertension guidelines and goals. 2003, our goal or our guideline was under 140 over 80, but for the high-risk diabetic or renal disease patient, under 130 over 80. J and C say 8, or the split-out group of J and C 8, recommended bumping this up for older individuals to 150 over 90 at this point. <clears throat> and this was higher than we had seen in a long time. It wasn't really data at that point, and there was, in fact, controversy, and half of the committee walked out at that point because of this 150 over 90. So it never really was ever published as JNC8. There's only a minority and majority report from them. And, to that, it, and NIH, NHLBI, got so fed up with it, they said, forget it, we're moving it out of JNC8. <coughs> over to ACC AHA guidelines, which are the new uh, guideline recommendations for NHLBI. The ACC and AHA brought in nine other societies for that. And in those other societies, they came out with these recommendations that 120 over 80 or less than is normal, and 130 to 139 is stage one hypertension, which requires non-pharmacologic in everyone, but in individuals with diabetes, chronic renal disease, or a atherosclerotic cardiovascular predicted risk over 10%, they have to be on medicine plus <coughs> non-pharmacologic therapy in that group. And this applies for individuals across the board, and the lower number of under 130 is now used for individuals over 65 years of age. So if we look at this, what we can see is that what was uh, for an older person, 140 over 90, temporarily bumped up to 150 over 90, is now been reset <coughs> to 130 over 65 for these individuals uh, for that. So we've gone from 140 up to 150, and we're now back to 130 for the elderly uh, population. So what are we left with? Well, here's the final thing that we had before. Hypertension awareness, treatment, and control are all important. We're doing a fair job on half of our patients today for this. We need to improve that. That involves patient and uh, uh, healthcare provider uh, cooperation as a team, bringing in other team members. It also means bringing in the community as well. We've talked about an extensive uh, discussion today about what are these aspects. One of these aspects in the complete program here is shown here, effective guidelines. Well, we have effective guidelines. You can see it's in only a small part of this slide. <clears throat> Much more needs to be done involving the community. That's why you're here today to bring in healthcare leaders from the community, other healthcare systems, to see what we can do to improve that to achieve our goal of the lowest cardiovascular event rate in these individuals who are at risk because of hypertension. And to make things simpler, because we have, in fact, different guidelines out there, ACC, uh, American Academy of Family Physicians and ACP, are still going a little bit with the JNC-8, 
whereas the newer ones, ACC guidelines, are a little lower. I would like to say that you could say this is controversy, but I think we're closer together than we would really seem. Because I consider it the following, my associate brought this out of his briefcase, as the following. <clears throat> Think of this as protection, okay? So in Sacramento, there are two ways to carry an umbrella. Up here, high threshold, and I get partial protection from hypertension that you can see. But when it's really sunny or when it rains a lot, I'm not gonna get total protection at this point. If I lower the threshold, lower the threshold for treatment for guidelines, I will get more protection. So lowering blood pressure guidelines gives me more protection at this time. But if I lower it too far, I hit the struts, I bump my head, and I might have syncope or hypertension. <laughs> but I'm not going to die at this point in time. Now the other issue is that right now you'd say it's not raining. That is true. The lower threshold and guidelines that I've proposed take a year to two years to work. So by the time the rain gets here, that may be helpful. So I'm asking you the following. Do you want to walk around with the umbrella this high and get partial protection? Do you want to lower it here? And if you tolerate it, what I do with my patients, if they do have syncope or significant hypotension, I back off at that point. So I'm going to lower it for maximum protection, back off only if they have those symptoms of syncope that are repetitive. They're not going to die you know, from it in most cases. And then you can adjust it in those cases. You're going to save cases. You're going to save about two individuals per thousand every year from death or mortality, stroke, or heart disease. And those would be the benefits. And I would use the umbrella and not the official or complete guidelines that I showed here, because this is not going to shelter me quite as much <laughs> as the umbrella. And if you really need to, <clears throat> the simplest way is to, and we've provided this to CDPH, is a pocket guide. And the pocket guide doesn't have all of these rules in it in the complete guidelines. But it is something that you, a clinician can carry into the office, pull out, and do a quick check of the medicines and the other things that will handle most of your patients, but not all of your patients at that time. We need to make it simple. We need to make it achievable for our healthcare systems. And we want to progress by protecting our patients for that. And based on that, we're now going to switch to the second part of the program which is going to look at and explore ways that Dignity Health and Sutter Health have looked at in improving their outcomes and control and diagnosis of hypertension. So I think we can introduce our next two individuals for this. And I will be delighted that they were able to attend today as we talk about healthcare systems. So, Dr. Annie Sly is the Director of Integrated, Integrated Quality Services at Sutter Medical, and she oversees ambulatory clinical quality and patient safety programs and initiatives with the performance improvements in key preventive areas. And so I'd like to introduce Dr. Sly to come up, and she's going to present some information related to Sutter Medical and their approach to the diagnosis and treatment of hypertension. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. Right. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so that was awesome review of the hypertension um, guidelines in this state um, affairs. So I am going to share today with you what we've done at Sutter Medical Foundation. Uh, blood pressure control has really been a key focus area for us over the past couple of years. Um, so, I'm going to show you a little bit, like, talk about some of the initiatives that we've done. Yeah, let's see, which you quicker? Can I can figure this out. Okay. 
So just a quick note about the Medical Foundation for those of you not familiar with our organization. Um, Teresa Fry is our CEO, and we are really spread throughout this area down towards Lano as well as all the way up to Yuba um, area. So we've got over a thousand um, online positions um, as well as um, 540 uh, positions with SIP, the independent positions we've got in our contact with. Um, so multiple locations, 84 care centers. Um, we take care of approximately 900,000 patients or so based on 2017 results. Um, and we've got 3,400 um, employees. So a quick snapshot. So where were we? So hypertension control. Um, so I'm fairly new to Prasada Medical Foundation. I've been here for almost three years. And um, one of the first things um, when we came, when I came on board is really looking at our totality of the quality of performance. And um, very quickly we realized that one key area that is so critically relevant to our patients' care and livelihood and wellness is blood pressure control. So back in 2016, <laughs> sorry. I'm um, afraid some people weren't able to hear you in the back. Uh, are you guys able to hear me okay? All right, cool. So where were we? So back in 2016, um, among about 36,000 patients of ours that meet our kind of dashboard criteria, um, only two thirds of them had their blood pressure under control. That's pretty horrendous, would you say? Especially given the fact that we just learned about the changes in guidelines and changes in uh, recommendations. So this data is actually based on the JNC8, you know, recommendations. Um, so this is for patients that are between 18 and 85, uh, with or without diabetes, whose most recent BP was adequately controlled. But adequately controlled here means that for patients less than um, 60 years of age, it's less than 140 over 90. Patients greater than 60 is actually 150 over 90. So as you all know, for those of you involved in quality metric um, performance, performance measurement always lags behind clinical guidelines, you know, by at least a couple of years. So this is kind of based on that. So it's a more lenient criteria. So having said that, knowing that we only had two thirds of our patients under control was definitely something that we wanted to work on. So we did some Kaizen events and we looked at the data, we looked at some information, um, got you know, a team together. And one of the top reasons why we were not controlling our patients is the fact that we weren't reviewing and acting on the results. Okay, when the patients, especially when the patients are in the clinic for the visit. So we looked at some data and we found that it's only 48%, so less than half of our patients who has elevated blood pressure during the visits were actually getting addressed. So, you know, it's not great. Could you say that again? So mm -hmm. when they were in the clinic, yeah, so these are patients coming into the care center. They had their blood pressure taken during the clinic visit in, in the office setting. And more than half of them are leaving the care center without anything being done about that elevated blood and we did, we found this out by doing some chart reviews. You know, did the patient get a referral to the cardiologist? Did the patient change their medication? Sorry. So, um, so yeah, we looked at, you know, any, in terms of dress, it could mean a multitude of different things. You know, were there lifestyle adjustments? Was there therapeutic changes? You know, was there a referral to other programs? So, um, so having said that, only half of our patients are getting addressed. So this is where we were in 2016, and so you can see Southern Medical Foundation, so the, the groups included here, Southern Medical Group, which is our largest group, Southern North up in the Yuba area, and then Southern Independent Physicians um, also as well, and then the total. Okay, so, so what did we do? Using one two slides, um, So what did we do? We did a whole bunch of different things, and I think it's really a totality of the efforts that we did that resulted in our uh, so first of all, we um, we publish, publish information on how we're doing. You know, so transparency and information sharing around how our care centers, how our providers are doing, <coughs> how we do as a whole, as an organization as well. That's down to the provider level. So uh, you know, so we publish a multitude of different reports that allows us to see how we're trending over time, but get down to relevant you know units um, for our care centers and providers. Um, we shared information about what the measurement is and the guidelines. Um, Dr. Buss is here in the room and she's really ahead of the clinical guidelines that for hypertension um, effort. Um, so, you know, this created awareness and tools and information that to help us take care of our patients. 
Um, engaging the care team is a huge aspect of it. Um, and so making sure that our staff is properly trained with blood pressure measurement, um, training, education, and not just to the clinicians, but also to the staff. You know, getting, making sure that our MA knows what to look for, making sure that they know how to take the blood pressure properly, the five minute. You know, so one of the things that we did was that we moved blood pressure measurement to the end of the MA grooming process. So a typical MA grooming process takes about six to seven minutes. So by doing that, by taking the blood pressure measurement at the end of the grooming process, we allow time for the patient to be sitting in the exam room um, for that process. They're not going to be quiet because we do have to ask you some questions, but you know we'll take that over. So you know, um, and, uh, so here's the process that we um, implemented. The other thing is that we had a huge push in, the, in addition to training our MAs to measure the blood pressure properly. We wanted to make sure that they are taking the second BP if the first one is elevated. So we put it into this workflow to ensure that a second BP is taken um, if the first one is elevated. And then making sure that that uh, second BP is documented properly. So many of our providers prefer to take their BP by themselves on their own. This is the week. They many of them take the BP uh, when they see the patient. And so making sure that those good levels are documented properly in vitals and in habit as opposed to um, in the progress notes. Um, our SIP providers, you know, especially those who are, are not on EPID, are documenting them using CPT codes, and that helps us capture the data for them. Okay. So what else do we do? So recall that I said that many of our patients are leaving the care center without getting their blood pressure addressed. And so some of the things that we implemented for that is to help, you know, queue up providers you know, to let them know that their patients have an elevated blood pressure today. Um, so we did something very low tech and simple. You know, little cards like this, you know, like the red cards that goes on the door or goes on the face sheet of the chart. Um, so something very simple like that, just a visual trigger for the provider to know that, hey, your patient has an elevated blood pressure today. You know, so just something, um, you know, something simple like that could actually have a big impact. We did see at the, one of the pilot care centers that we did that said we went from 48 percent not having a, you know, the um, address all the way up to 80, 85, 90 percent. So simple cues, you know, and that's been sustained. Easy for the MA to do, easy to implement, doesn't require epic changes, etc. Um, so the other thing we did was we engaged our specialists. So in terms of measuring the blood pressures in our specialist office, really you know, making that a standard for them as well. Every patient, every visit, every, you know, we call this a specialty. And the, other, the thing that we ask the specialist office is not that we ask them that they're the ones going to be responsible for managing the blood pressure. We want them to let the PCP <coughs> know, so a quick staff message to the PCP's office, letting them know that, hey, I saw your patient today and their blood pressure is elevated, you know, maybe I want to consider follow-up. So that's all, very simple. Um, so we put that workflow in place. Talk on the disease management engagement. So you heard, um, you know, we talked about earlier in terms of the effectiveness of telehealth for the disease management. I want to give a shout out to Dr. Buss and Susan Marks here. They are leaders for our Southern Health Telephone Disease Management Program. And we really, you know, have been collaborating very closely with them in regards to identify patients that will really you know, engage with the program and, you know, benefit from that telephone and personal interaction with, uh, with the nurses um, and the care team there. Outreach efforts, you know, I have a pretty robust outreach team that as we call patients for, you know, getting their colonoscopies done or mammograms done, if their blood pressure is elevated and they haven't been seen, we try to make sure that they come in for a follow-up appointment. So things like that, you know, the, uh, the touches that we can provide to patients at different points of time, as we can um, work to keep up quality. And linking it to patient well-being, and the fact that, you know, we're, as we're improving the blood pressure control, we're increasing the risk of cardiovascular risk, and telling the stories, and linking that um, for our care centers, um, staff, and clinicians. Okay, so this is what it looks like on a care center view. I wanted to kind of give you a sense of what <coughs> that means in terms of the things that we do, and how that translates to what the care centers do. So at the top here, um, this is our Davis Family Practice Medicine Group, and at the top here, this is their tracking for their second blood pressure screening. So you can recall that the board flow is that the first one's high, you take a second one. For all, almost all of our care center, um, primary care centers, the first blood pressure taken is very high, you know, it's in the 95 to 100% range. 
is the second BP that we wanted to really put in place and encourage it to be a standard. So you can see when we started this back in 2017 time frame, this planet was pretty low. And, you know, in, um, and they've done several interventions like the Red Heart under the World War to remind them that this a BP, this patient has an elevated BP. Um, we they implement little kind of um, patient reminder cheesies to kind of get the patient involved as well with any case on the level. Um, and they also put in little cheesies on the blood pressure machine, which are actually blood pressure machines as well, so that we're not really limited by that. Um, so by doing a bunch of different um, PDSA cycles and changes, you can see that they improve their second blood pressure screening results. And then concurrently, alongside that, the, on the bottom here, you see the blood pressure control results for this particular care center. And this is uh, broken down by clinician, and this is broken down by MA. So really engaging the entire team in regards to uh, what is being done. And so you can see, just very recently in August, this particular care center hit our, uh, our internal P90 target of 80%. So we had a big celebration for this particular case up there. Um, so where are we now? So um, since 2016, when we started this whole journey, um, our blood pressure control rate overall for Southern Medical Foundation, um, which includes the three medical groups, um, went from 66% to 79%. So now I recognize it's a more lenient criteria. However, it's a great step and it's a um, you know, the fact that we have about 4,200 more patients under with their blood pressure under control. And then when we, I, um, when we pull up the number needed to treat, um, you know, number, um, data for the patients that we could be low, for these patients, we are lowering their cardiovascular event. I, don't, I can't necessarily directly tie it to our patients because I don't have details on whether or not they're all on antihypertensive medications and their risk factors, but even just looking at, you know, we just keep assuming that all of them are the lowest risk group, I think we're still preventing a significant number of events um, by doing this. So that's where we are. Um, this is just a um, graph showing you the trend, you know, like I said, we started here in 2016, and you can see it's been kind of bumps along the way. Um, of, um, but we're now here and we're very close to our internal benchmark of um, the P98 threshold um, 80%. So hopefully in a couple months we'll hit that and we'll see how that goes. So very quick story on um, saying, uh, what we did. So here's just a quick listing of success ingredients. You know, I think a lot of things really have to come together in order for us to achieve that type of improvement across a relatively large population. Leadership champions, you know, um, again, Dr. Hope, say, uh, Dr. Webblow and Dr. Hope in the room for us, some of the independent physicians. You know, really having the senior level executives champion the fact that blood pressure control is important, is our key focus measure, our key quality measure. Our chief medical officer for South Medical Group actually made it into a friendly competition in regards to challenging each of the DBPs, our division of vice presidents in the region to improve their blood pressure and get to P90, and when we get there first, he offered to buy a bottle of wine. And it just so happened, actually, for the seven, out of the seven regions for Southern Medical Foundation, Southern Medical Group, five of the seven, no, four of the seven, hit P90 in the same month. So he had to buy multiple bottles. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then of course, you know, really the clinician engagement, of course, is key, but, you know, care team support. You know, getting your care team, you know, your MA and your office staff and, you know, everyone around you, the, um, you know, telephonic seat management, and my outreach team, getting everyone around to support <coughs> this, um, working towards the same goal, I think it's really critical. Putting standard workflows in place. The visual management, both in terms of the visual cues for the provider as well as the um, huddle force, you know, having that data and information, you know, visible to all those involved. Um, leveraging friendly competitions and then recognizing the achievements. We have multiple opportunities for reporting out and to have our care centers and clinicians share the stories as well as their accomplishments. So just a quick list of um, um, some of the things that we have found helpful and I think it's all reproducible and it's uh, all things that everyone can leverage and <coughs> apply to other metrics um, or at other places. So great, uh, great effort, and we appreciate that.
Um, one question in the friendly competition and the other things, is there a variation in your clinicians in their achieving each of those targets? And when you, in fact, 